Hello, I'm Maurizia, and this is Service Design Show, episode number 203. We need a new form of leadership, and we need it now. If we want to move away from the 1900s industrial age mental models and finally get rid of the dehumanizing aspects of large organizations. Today, we are joined by Marzia Arrico, a solopreneur, author, speaker, and passionate advocate for transforming organizations. Marzia achieved her PhD not for the title, but because she is generally fascinated by the topic. She spent a decade leading teams at one of the most respected service design agencies. And today, she's forging her own path as an entrepreneur. Marcia brings a unique blend of experience and audacity. So buckle up, because Marcia is about to challenge how you think about work and inspire us to build organizations that are truly alive. In today's conversation, we are going to explore why traditional organizational structures are failing us in today's rapid changing world. We'll talk about the power of adopting a living being mindset for organizations, how to create a workplace that fosters growth and empowerment, practical steps to start transforming your organization, and examples of real world companies thriving with a living being model. Marcia shares a lot of wisdom with us in this conversation. One of my favorite moments was when she shared how to stay true to your authentic self and make sure that self-awareness doesn't tip to the dark side and become arrogance. And maybe the most interesting part was the parenting strategy she uses to make sure her own son knows the difference. That's a part you definitely don't want to miss. So join me for a great conversation and I'll catch you at the end for my closing reflections. I'm your host, Mark Fontaine, and you are listening to the Service Design Show. Welcome back to the show, Basha. Thank you, Mark. It's a pleasure to be here. We are going to talk about how to turn organizations into living beings and transforming, moving away from machines, correct? Yeah, yeah, that's correct. Yes, that's okay. the topic that I chose. Yeah, that's the topic we're going to explore. But before we do that, we have to acknowledge that you've been on the show before. Yes, and there was is. always a, a quiz question. Do you remember oh, which no, episode? Oh, the quiz. It was. Yes, yes. <laughs> I actually been thinking the first time I did it, that afterwards I was like, why did I respond like that? I really mm. don't believe that. So we're, we're, I'm we're glad we're going to do it again. <laughs> uh, but do you know which episode it was? I, I looked it up this morning. No, it was 189. Mm, no, it was way before. It was 129, mm. almost to almost. the date three years ago. Um, nice. And we were discussing organizational dark matter oh, in yeah, that that's episode. True. Yeah. So three years have gone by. Has anything changed for you? Oh, wow. Yes, a lot. <laughs> give us, give a, us lot a quick of, update. A lot has changed. So I no longer work for LiveWork. I've been there for 10 years. Now I'm a solopreneur. So I work for myself. I'm writing a book. I am um, recording a whole video series on women design leaders. So I shifted quite a bit on my focus for my work, I guess. Um, I'm still living in Rotterdam, though. I bought a house by the beach in Sicily that became my temple. My son now is five, so it's kind of a grown-up, you know. Nothing has changed. <laughs> a lot has changed. <laughs> Uh, very curious uh, how your life will look in another three years when we come back for the trilogy. Um, okay. Marcia, so uh, today we're going to uh, jump straight into our conversation from machines to living beings. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit more about the road that you took that mm. led you to this moment? Okay, I'm going to start by the moment in which I realized that that was a thing that I needed to look into. And that was 2019, and I was in London, 
and it was at the kickoff or of a large customer centric transformation program for a very big global bank. And we were in this, you know, you can imagine like it's a skyscraper or, you know, glass and metal, whatever. And we were in this room, we were looking London. It's quite beautiful, actually. And there were people from New York and people from London. And during the kickoff, one of these people stood up and said, <clears throat> Marcy, I just want to say something so that you know, this is a place that dehumanizes people. And I'm like, okay. Yes, I kind of knew, but it's good on you that you actually say it. And so, you know, I dropped the thing and then we continued. And, and then I had a chat with this person. I, I used to smoke with them. So we were in the alley smoking. And I was like, can you tell me a bit more about that? And then he basically described, uh, you know, entering, you, you basically entered in the moment in which you joined an organization like that, uh, a, a machine, and you were treated like a part of the machine. And so I, I intuitively knew it, but no one had ever kind of told me this story with such words and really touched me in a sense. And I started thinking how, you know, that's probably the reason why a lot of the designers that I used to manage back then we're really struggling with working with sectors of this kind, of organizations of this kind. You know, they were coming through service design and in roles of service designers with a bit more, if you like, I don't want to say naive, but more positive outlook on, on the world, which is, you know, I'm going to do some work that will have social impact and this and that. And they did not find that. And they found this, you know, machine that were quite, um, the humanizes, you know, humanizing the people that were in it and everything around it. And so, and I've always been very fond of organizations, which is really a weird thing to say, but, you know, I've always thought, you know, we need them, you know, we have these organizations, you know, we have electricity and, and cars and trains and healthcare, because at one point someone thought to put together skills of different group of people to actually make something larger happen than any one single human being could. And so I think that the very, uh, you know, reason why organizations exist is, is super important. And I think that there is a ginormous potential of, of, of such, you know, intelligent and skilled group of people together. But it's just the metaphor that we've been using to build the infrastructure and, and to design work is really not fit for the needs of today. And so, you know, I've started researching where does that come from? And no surprise, you know, it's, you know the, the, these models, organizational models, uh, have the roots in the 19th century, basically, to respond to a need of a world that was very different back then, right? So imagine it was a world that was a primarily agrarian economy, so agriculture, and then all of a sudden there's been a shift to industrialization, right? So everyone wanted to drop the horse and have a car. And so the need there was, you know, high volume production as cheaply across as possible, as, as, as fast as possible. We knew it's they were all the same, right? And so the, the organizational model that then emerged out of it was a model that was very much around, you know, hierarchy, command and control, one decision is made at the top and then cascaded down, division of labor. So you do one thing and you do it very well, right? Um, and the whole thing was around this idea of predictability. You want, you want, you know, the whole process to be very predictable. And so that model of organization was perfect fit for that need, right? For the need of scale is one thing, repeat it. But today's needs are very different. Like we live in a very different world. And, and I think at the, at the bottom, you know, at, at, the, at the core of um, all of the challenges that we deal with today, both grand challenges, let's say climate change, you know, massive things at the global scale, or, you know, smaller challenges like retain my position in my market, you know, as an organization or continue to be relevant, you know, something way smaller than that. Um, the fundamental piece that, 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 that brings all of these different challenges together is rapid change. Like things are changing at, at a speed that is somewhat unprecedented. You know, if you think about generative AI, you know, it was, you know, you had a group of women and men working on it for decades, but the average consumer wouldn't know about it. And then all of a sudden you have ChatGPT, and then everyone went mad, right? Like I had organizations coming to me say, can you do something with AI? And I'm like, are you hearing yourself? Like, what is this? Like, what, what, what is your, what are you trying to do? Like, it's another technology for technology sake. Like, no, I'm not going to do anything with AI until you explain me what you're trying to achieve. I say no, but a lot of other people said, yes, sure. You know, I'm going to grab this 100,000, whatever. I'm going to do this thing. And so 
And so it's like, you know, random response with not real purpose or strategy. And with an organizational structure that is just no fit to respond to this thing. It's just very stiff. And so, and, and in a lot of these organizations that have really smart people, right? And it's such a shame in the use of the time and talent. And so I really believe that there is a fantastic opportunity to unleash uh, potential in these places by really rethinking the way we design work and we design the, the, the very model of the organization. And I think, you know, a shift of metaphor or really mindset of belief from machine to living being is fundamental because a living being is, you know, is adaptable. A specific needs to change, uh, but also it's creative, right? It has the the, the 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 ability to create and make something new, to envision desirable futures, right? Which is not something that a machine can do. And so this is my starting point right now for any other work that I do. Really, thank you for that uh, context. That helps a lot. So shifting mental models, uh, our world is different. Uh, the structures that we've built to solve certain types of challenges. Challenges are changing, have changed, so we need to rethink our structures as well. You're using the metaphor of living beings. I think one other metaphor that I've been using a lot is thinking about work or organizations as theater, uh, mm -hmm. much more interactive. <clears throat> the, the underlying question I have here is a lot of us probably recognize the fact that this is going on, maybe even... Um, get frustrated with this, but we still go on doing the thing we're mm -hmm. doing. What makes you sort of stand up at this moment and try to change this? Well, I think what makes me do it is the realization that I can, you know, for, for a long time, I've been seeing these organizations as, you know, these are very important people, very important places, and, you know, you shouldn't, you know, you shouldn't there. And there was a moment in my career where I actually realized this, this is people, you know, they, they wake up, they have breakfast, they go to the toilet, you know, they do the things that everyone does. Uh, and, you know, they have their opinions and their knowledge and the truth and I have mine and, and it's not that mine is less than theirs. And so because I can, I do it. Tell us more about that moment of realization. You know, obviously, you know, I guess when I was like a junior and media designer, you know, going around doing my practice, I used to see these people. It's very important people, you know, that, that I was not worth of their time almost, you know, they were very busy and, you know, with the grander ideas to work with and, and, and big strategies. And, and, you know, they knew absolutely way more than I did. But actually, the more I worked with these people, the, the, the more I realized that everyone is really winging it. Like, no one really knows what they're doing, you know? I mean, they know parts of it. They know certain, you know, because of their experience, of their education. or, But they, they absolutely don't know it all. And everyone has some level of imposter syndrome that tells you, oh, my God, I mean, they will. You know, at one point, one CEO actually told me, I live in fear that at one point they will wake up and realize that I don't know what I'm doing. You know, so this dude was, uh, anyway, it was like a white, middle-aged, you know, very privileged man, you know, you would, I was not expecting him to come with that kind of statement, uh, but he did, and, it, and it, you know, that's the way he felt, and I was like, yeah, I mean, it's like, like, everyone, everyone feels like that, you know, independent of your job role, I guess that even Obama felt like that, you know, and so, and so that was somewhat liberating. In a way that, you know, because you don't know what I'm doing, I can really try. And it's not that it, nothing is going to happen, really. So, so what kind of permission did you give yourself? What were you holding back on in the past that you sort of slowly, maybe mm. radically started to do? Yeah. I think I got to the point that I'm, the realization that I was good enough, you know? that I'm actually good enough for this context, that I know as much as other people know, but in very different ways, that I have skills that they don't have, and they know things that I, that, that I don't. And so you can learn from anyone if you like. And as long as you, you know, present yourself, show yourself, uh, you know, in the world as authentically as possible, but also as a service as possible, right? I learned very early the lesson that, you know, going in, trying to sell an idea or a thing that is better than others doesn't really work. But so we, with that understanding that you're a person with your limitations and the fact that you might not necessarily know more than I do. And then I'm actually not, I know enough to actually be worth of the present in this room uh, and, you know, entering the room being a service that usually works, you know, and mm -hmm. you end up producing things that otherwise you would never be able to, to do. Can you give uh, an example? Like, what are you producing now that you maybe didn't do 
before? Like I'm entering a completely new uh, sector. You know, I've, I've been working in, in my career in more than 20 different sectors, but it was usually the traditional ones, you know, like telcos, pharmas, you know, banking. And now I'm entering the, the realm of construction companies, like re big real estate companies and working more and more with people that are not necessarily managers or leaders in, in organizations in the way that I've been knowing, but more like entrepreneurs, right? So they're more cowboys, if you like. They're, they're, the rules are very different there. And uh, and with that mindset, I'm like, okay, so you you know everything about your sector. And I don't know anything about the sector, I have to say. I mean, my father is an architect. That's pretty much it. <laughs> so And so... I've entered this uh, this sector with completely different ideas around what urban planning is and what you know citizens' needs are and and how to go about actually thinking about the the, the planning of a of an urban area of a completely new area, or you know what what the purpose of a building is, and that has actually been refreshing in my conversations and I've seen how people around me have really welcomed that that perspective. In a way that I don't know if I would have done maybe 10 years ago, because I would have thought, oh, I know nothing about this thing. Uh, is it, can I actually say this, you know, I'm, I'm probably going to look at, like I'm stupid or I don't know enough. And I guess, you know, in, in, in the last 10, of 10 years, probably, I just learned that I don't care. You know, even if I look stupid to you, it's your problem, not mine. You know, it's curiosity. You go out with whatever you have and try to tackle that thing. And whatever you think about this, I couldn't care less, honestly. And Here, here's a question, Marcia. So uh, we're drifting off a little bit uh, from the topic we started with, but I'm really curious to know more about this because you're also coaching and mentoring young design professionals. Have you found a way to shortcut this path of increased confidence? Or do you just have to work for 10 years and sort mm -hmm. of slowly but surely learn that everybody is winging it and at some point start experimenting? Or can we, yeah. fresh out of university, have the same level of ambition, courage? What's your experience? To be honest with you, I think it's good if when you are out of university, you don't have the, that level of confidence, you know, because in a sense, you know, I think you, it, it's good to have a, a journey to reach it because you're going to look cocky otherwise, you know. So I don't know. Yeah, you know, I think there is it's good to have a journey. Shortcuts great. I agree. But, you know, there is it, it's good to have a, a moment of realization for yourself. Um To be honest, I discovered two things in my coaching journey with people that there are certain cases where actually I advise together with me as a career coach, as a design leadership coach, to also have a therapist. Because sometimes um, some of this lack of confidence are really rooted down into the way you grew up, into the way your parents have treated you. And, and that's not, I'm not a therapist, right? So recognition of what's my role and what's other people's roles. And, and so, and that has been incredibly beneficial. Like the best uh, relationships that I had with people that I was coaching were, were with people that had a therapist next to me. So they were tackling, you know, shit from their past or childhood with, with the therapist. And with me more like, okay, now that I understand why I think this, well, my triggers, right? What are my triggers? Then how can we use this knowledge to make me a better, more fulfilled or more effective professional? Mm. So that's usually when people come to me asking for coaching, I said, do you have a therapist? Because I believe that everyone should have one. <laughs> so that's one thing. And the second thing is really working on the way people talk to themselves. So I usually ask, you know, what way do you talk to yourself? And how would you talk to yourself if you were a five-year-old? Or how would you talk to yourself as the most mature version of yourself, right? And so to hear in the way people talk to themselves, in the head, it's just the and change that is the very first starting point for everything else, right? So for a, a, a long time, and I still do it actually. I wake up in the morning, I look myself in the mirror, and I go like, "You're awesome! You're so awesome!" Like the stuff that you're doing, groundbreaking, you know. And I truly believe it. And I tell to myself, and then my husband usually enters the bathroom and says, yeah, "Girl, you are right." And so we have this pumping situation in the morning, and I do exactly the same with my son. I go like, you can do whatever you want in life, dude. I mean, this is like, you are really the thing, the deal, you know? And, and that really, 
you know, having someone who does it with you is great, but also do it with yourself is so important, you know? Interesting. The balance between being confident and being cocky. I, I think a lot <laughs> <Yes>. of people, <clears throat> yeah. a lot of people will probably, uh, in from a perspective of fear, mm. rather stay on the safe side and, uh, yeah, yeah hold back yeah. rather than being the fear of being seen as somebody who's cocky. That's interesting, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think the balance there is I love myself and appreciate myself for what I am and I'm confident about my abilities. It's one thing. The other thing is, which is the the, the threshold of, of becoming cocky, is I'm better than you, right? So the thing is that I'm not better than anyone else. I'm just very happy with myself. And so that is, I think, the balance to keep in mind. Thanks. Thanks for sharing that. Um... Let's let's circle back for a moment to machines and living beings. Uh, you already mentioned something about the differences between those two models. Big question, of course, there is how do we move? How do we make this transition? Is this something? Is this a gradual shift, or do we need a revolution? Where do we start? So many questions. So, how do we get there? Okay, so. We start from people. And so at this very point, I've been looking at, you know, what, what is the material of organizations, right? Because, you know, I'm you, treating the organization as my object of design. So as you would, you know, tackle the design of a chair, you would think about, you know, metal and boot and whatever, and the properties of these different materials. Tackling the design of an organization, I'm thinking about what is my material at the end. And the material are people, are processes, and it's technology, pretty much it. And so I'm starting from people. And uh, so the focus that I've been having in the last year is really around leadership. And I have, I, and that's my starting point. And when I say leadership, I don't mean leaders, right? It's not the, the people in power in these organizations, but it's the concept of leading the way forward, right? And I really fundamentally believe that anyone independently from the job role or that position in the organization can lead. Even if you're an intern or a junior, you can lead. You can lead by showing up in the world in a certain way, by showing in the way you treat people around you, in the way you collaborate with people, right? And so my definition, the definition that I use of leadership is a definition from two scholars and practitioners that I absolutely love. Uh, they are Francis Frey and Anne Morris. And uh, the way they define it is leadership is making others better as a result of your presence and making sure that the impact continues into your absence. And what that means is that basically leadership is not about you. Right? It's really not about you. It's about the people that are around you. And, and so I've been thinking about in what way we've been leading up until now and what is kind of the type of leadership needed to thrive into this new world of organizations and human be, be, living beings, right? And, and, and I really use some of the research that I've developed in my PhD. You know, in my PhD, I've looked at how to allow design or design mindset to enter an organizational context, what are the, the rules there and what are the uh, kind of uh, mechanisms to do it. And I really looked at in what way design can help me craft this thing. And so fundamentally, there are five sk sk um, characteristics of this new leader, which is about you know being more than human-centered, being empathic to the context in which you're operating, both in terms of people and in terms of things that affect us, actors and factors, right? And this is one of the most difficult things, right? Like, you know, everyone say, oh, you should be empathic. But, you know, if you if you don't naturally have it, and a lot of people don't, I don't have it either. It's a really hard skill to train. And so the question of how do I show up in the world in an empathic way? How can I treat this person or this situation in an empathic way? It's, it's one that, you know, you should be asking yourself on a daily basis. And if, if you do only one thing and one thing only, it's just put down your phone while you're talking with someone else, right? I've been in meetings with in corporate settings where people literally text each other in the room. Like they are in the room and they text each other. It's just so rude, you know? Uh, and really not in public. So, you know, you're really showing that you are not even listening to the person on the other side. 
Um, the other thing is about this kind of experimental mindset. So one of the things that the organization as a, as a machine has is being very stiff, right? So you have this, uh, you know, the silos, the functions, processes that are really waterfall that you plan, you predict and plan over a period of long, you know, a couple of years. And now this is just no longer possible. You know, when I, when I, when I started the transformation program and someone asked me a roadmap for two years, I go like, sure thing, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a roadmap for two years, but I know that we're going to be in two weeks, right? It just doesn't, you know, the, the world doesn't allow for that to happen. So you can have a direction, that's for sure, like a direction, but breaking it down, the actual activities that we're going to make, it's like, you know, it's crazy. Uh, but, you know, even that is a boundary object that sometimes is needed, so fine. But this mindset of experimentation is in, you know, experimentation is not a thing that you do at a stage of the double diamond, you know? It's not that you prototype when the stage comes. You know, it's it's a, it's an approach to work. It's an approach to life, even. You know, so you know, at every single stage of whatever thing you do, small experiments. You know, try a thing that maybe some someone thinks is crazy or it's not going to work, but try it. You know, and see how that works and learn something out of it. Uh, that is really an approach to to work that that is completely different, completely counterintuitive to the way organizations today are. Set. And then there is another area that is really about what I call like transformative tension, right? Because design as leadership, I think you know, there is a lot of, a lot of uh, similarities there are about crafting and making possible, making real futures that today are not existing, that people might not necessarily think about, right? And so with design, you basically craft it, you make it tangible, you show it with people. With leadership, you lead people towards that future, right? But in a way that, how do you do that? Like, how do you, um, as a leader, make sure that that happens. And so there are a few things. And one fundamental thing is, is stories. What are the stories that you that you tell? And so as a leader, I think that the one, top one thing that you do is crafting the right stories to the right group of people with the right words that really resonate with that specific core to really bring them into another space, a space where transformation can happen, where change can happen, where your beliefs are challenged, right? And that's the, basically the number one role of, of a leader today, should be at least, right? But in a way that people can buy into it. Because, you know, a leader alone is not a leader. He's just a solo person. So people need to believe in the stories that you're saying yeah, and understand the stories that you're saying and internalize the stories that you're saying to, to drive, you know, forward. So these are some of the aspects that I've been looking at and some of the aspects that I, that I really usually unpack with current leaders, but especially with, with people that are just about to, you know, get in official kind of leadership roles. Um, because that's, uh, you know, those are our hope, I think, you know, the people that right now are two or three years before that, you know, shift, um, being able to actually operate like this now. It's a, it's a great uh, opportunity to then, you know, generate, uh, um, you know, managers and leaders in organizations that can really drive the, the 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 work in different ways. And these are the people that basically start challenging the infrastructure as well, right? So processes and policies can only change if people want to change them. Period. Uh, and so once you start working this way, you will immediately see how the the infrastructure that doesn't serve your purpose. You know, and a very simple example is. You know, you are developing a new product or service and, you know, you need to ask for some budget for the research and the development of this thing. And usually in organizations, you have budgeting cycles that are yearly, right? There is one window in a year in which you can make a business case and um, and request, you know, the money for the specific thing. That's not very iterative, right? You have to ask all of the money you need for the year, you know? Um but if you work with an experimental mindset, you want, might want to try a few things first and then discover that actually the amount of money that you need is this. And 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 so do it in multiple, uh, you know, moments. And so a lot of the leaders that I've been working with as man have managed after a period of time to really change the budgeting cycle from, you know, yearly to quarterly, for example, right? Because, you know, working with peers, they realized that actually was a way better, uh, you know, approach to to drive you know iteration and experiments and you know, and you know work that is meaningful and avoiding that there is left of a budget that people have to spend otherwise next year they're not gonna get that amount of money right and so you know once yeah and I really believe that once you see it you can't unsee it you cannot go back right it's just you know if you if you see this different way of working in the way things are connected in a more systemic way in a more realistic way and you experiment in working like that, you can never go back to what you had before. You, you feel like an idiot, right? 
you feel like a monkey yeah pressing buttons what's really interesting about this story is i'm going to assume that a lot of us believe this hope this are optimistic that we can get there uh, maybe we've already adopted this way of leading without being very explicit about this. But then there's the other part, which you mentioned uh, about the design material of organizations, which is, for instance, processes. So these processes are set up to facilitate a certain type of being, working, doing, outputs, inputs. Then we, as this new type of leadership, get in uh, try to advocate something different, what happens is we get chewed up by the system, by the processes and spit out at the other, at the other end because the system, the processes want sort of the traditional, the existing type of leadership. Yeah, but how the, how the, do we deal with that? Yeah, the processes don't have a will by themselves. The processes are things and things are made by humans. Mm -hmm. So the point is, it's me against you, right? And your view of the world, right? It's not me against the process because the process, it, just, it can change. It can change overnight, right? That's easy. It, it's it's the, the debate, if you like, between two different groups of people that carry fundamentally different logics, right? And so I'm carrying a logic that is about, you know, the, the human limb and adaptability and, you know, iteration and all of that. And you will have on the other side people to carry other logics. And the question is, what are these logics? Can you break down and define the way, the, gr the actual group of people and the logics that these people carry, right? And, and those logic basically dictate what is legitimate with, within this organization and what is not. And, and dictate the artifacts that are used to make work happen. And policies and processes are one of those artifacts, right? And so I don't think the question is advocating or trying to change the process itself straight away. I think the point is connect to the other people that you're working with, understand where they're coming from, understand the composition of the logic, and, and, and get to a common ground where you can progress together to a better state of things. This is not a quest that you can do on your own or with a small group of peers. And it's not even a question of, you know, what's more pressure uh, on the system. It's a question that of really creating enough critical mass to make things move in mm. a way that is meaningful going forward. And it's not easy and it doesn't happen over time and it's not fancy and it really requires, you know, real uh, dedication and patience. And a lot of people will quit. Like after a while, they just give up. Can you take us into that room where we're sitting next to somebody who has a different perspective on the world? Let's maybe stereotype a little bit. Um, they have an MBA degree, they uh, fit very well into the system that has been carefully built over the last hundred years. Um, can, can you take us into that room and, and what type of conversation would you have with this person? You mean the person that recognizes the system that dehumanizes or the person that doesn't? I would say the person who is maybe even oblivious to the fact that there is an alternative approach right? and right. he's doing or she's, or they, right. what is currently being rewarded and maybe the thing that they've been taught in yeah. school, in management school. Yeah, yeah. And and there you are, uh, Marcia, with a different perspective on the world. Can you take us into the room and what yeah. kind of conversation would you have with them? Yeah. So I try to get very practical as soon as possible. Um, I first always usually listen to the narrative and usually people in general, not just these people, people in general are, are a very limited number of narratives that they use in these organizations. Like the stories that they tell are always pretty much, there, four or five, and, and the words are pretty much you know, 10 or 15, and because the priorities are those. And so I listen at the beginning. So usually the first three, four meetings, I never talk, rarely talk, and really listen to, or, or I just talk enough to legitimize my present presence in these rooms, um, but really listen to the narratives that they carry. And then I tend to get very practical as soon as possible, picking up a case, an opportunity, or a, or, a, or a part of whatever they are doing and showing in what way, the way they have been using to tackle the thing could benefit from 
a slight change, right? So if we did it this way, this is what you could, but you know, gain, right? For your specific mission, for your specific goal, for your specific bonus target, whatever is your thing, just showing, you know, if we did this, maybe this other way, uh, you could benefit out of it, right? And usually people in front of that, they go, oh yeah, well, sure. Yeah, as long as it's a benefit for themselves, it's great, you know? They listen to you and, and they go for it. They, they take the risk, if you like, right? Um, so you're bringing them out of that uncertain space of having to believe that you have a better way of doing things to actually showing in what way this is beneficial for myself. And that's usually the beginning, right? So that is like the first step. And usually it's not something very meaningful from a designer strategic perspective, but it is from them and that uh, for them. And, and, and that's good to actually start a relationship. And what you want to do is really build the trust, right? And so by showing that you're a service of their mission, whatever mission is, even if you don't believe it, even if the point is, you know, I don't know, like something like reduce headcount or which is some horrific stuff like that, or, or you know, like, uh, you know, automate this and that, or, you know, Find, you know, I need to reduce co the, the duplication of effort. This is a, usually a good one, right? Showing in what way you can reduce costs by reducing duplication of effort across the system. Um, and you do that thing, and then you start building trust, building an understanding that we're in together for a common goal, and then start defining what the common goal is, and then start showing in what way, what, the way I am thinking about the world could be beneficial for other things, but always in very practical terms, right? Because otherwise you lose people. They just stop listening. There is no reason why they should listen to me uh, rather than someone else. You've you've shared some hypothetical examples and without going into names, I'm curious if you recall a story, a moment where you actually had this conversation and what happened? Like what was the conversation? So there were two. One that I remember clearly. So one in operations, so some, someone that was leading an operation unit department, and one that was um, in technology. So it was a CTO of a very large bank. And so in the CTO, in, let's start from the operations. So in the operation side, what, what's the biggest currency in operations is reducing costs, right? Everyone is always trying to reduce the cost of running the operations of a specific organization. And so, and there was a very big push into automation. They wanted to make sure that they use technology at best to automate the processes. So there was less manual intensive or labor intensive from, from actually employees. And so the way that they were going about it was very much technology push, right? So they took uh, whatever technology was available for whatever vendor and trying to push the thing into employees or into the system in a way that was incredibly costly incredibly expensive in terms of resources and time and was not really showing any results. And so that was a high frustration for this person, right? It was a high frustration point because, you know, there was a lot of money put into it and not a lot of return. And so I started showing, okay, this is how I heard that feeling, that, that frustration, and because, you know, I was asking around, what is the energy of the organization right now? What is the thing that everyone is talking about? Well, what are you grilled on at this very moment? And that was the thing. And so I was working with my team on what we call a service architecture. We were working on, you know, mapping out what all the, the, the products and services that this company is delivering and in what way this company is doing that. And so I suggested we can start using, you know, it was a very, very early draft. Huh? It was like probably 15 or 20 percent in uh, this, you know, the, the, the offer was so complex that we needed so many people to be able to, 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 to do this thing. And, and so I saw an opportunity. I saw an opportunity to, for opening doors for us to actually complete this map, but an opportunity for her uh, to actually use it to show in what way technology could be, you know, helpful in very specific and tailored moment rather than just a flat blanket, right? And so I suggested that I showed our very, um, you know, early stage, if you like, draft and she, using some of the words that I knew she was using out there. Um, in our town hall meetings, for example, right? I attended one, so I I, I could see what, what the narrative there was. And um, and so she loved it. She said, okay, so there is a little budget, you know, just, uh, you know, if you can get me to this point, it would be great. And so we managed to get their trust and we were keeping it very much in, informed and involved. And we really steered a bit the kind of work that we were doing to make sure that that could be accommodated in a way that was really clear. But it really helped us to move the word 
really further, right? We got at the end of this piece of work, we were probably 60% in to what we originally wanted to be doing. Can I, hold, uh, yeah, before you go into the second one, how, from your perspective, does did this new type of leadership uh, it sort of uh, exemplify in this story? How did you, how do you feel you were able to bring that in? You are a service of someone else. You're not trying to push an idea. You're trying to listen what this person is trying to achieve and in what way I can make this better for all parties involved with my current knowledge and skills, right? And so it's a question of empathizing. Now, now you need it with the organizational machine because it's easy to say this is bullshit, you know, but really empathizing with the actual machine. Like, why is the machine working this way? Why are things organized this way? Why is this woman going crazy about this thing, you know? Why are they choosing to go technologist first and flat, you know, rather than be judgmental guy that know nothing about what they're talking about? It's like, okay, I see your, you know, I don't agree but I understand where you're coming from. And so I'm trying to use the knowledge that I have and whatever work we can do to, to be a service of that specific thing that you're doing, right? And so that's one thing. The other thing is create that transformative tension, right? Because you said, okay, we're fixing this automation need that you have. But by doing that, we are infusing a completely new way of working that, 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 that instills change, right? We're making decisions in a way that is unprecedented here because no one in organizations gets a map of how things connect and no one ever uses that map to prioritize things in an informed way. And so through that piece of work, to fix a specific point, pain point of hers or you know, goal that she had, we started instilling fundamentally change, change in the way people work. It, this reminds me of our previous uh, conversation where we talked about dark matter. The other thing uh, often related to dark matter is the story of Trojan horses. Yeah. It is the example of okay. bringing in leadership as a Trojan horse. Yeah, definitely. It is. Um, the other example that you wanted to share had something to do with technology, I think. Yeah. So the other issue that was going on at the very point in a completely different line of business completely different team unit, like completely different story, was uh, that the CTO needed to prove the return of investment of his tech spend, and he was having issues doing that. And so we used that, and it, there was a lot of pressure from the CEO to get to the number. And so that was another kind of burning platform. People were being grilled right and left. There was a lot of AI involved, uh, you know, because they were, again, you know, technology first. Can, can technology tell us this thing? And we basically used the same work that we were doing with the operations leader uh, on the other side and really look at, okay, so this is interesting. It, it, it's looking at uh, what, what is the return of all of the money that is spending in developing basically technology, right? And so we'll, and, and a lot of these things were products, products that were external to customers and also internal to, to, to employees. And in our map, we had products mapped, right? So the question then was uh, how much is this product cost to be built and maintained? And what is the actual benefit that this product brings to the organization? And we started saying, okay, this product serves multiple services, right? There are these five services that benefit for the presence of this product. And so we started looking, okay, so if you look at the service level, how much revenue does this service bring and how much the service cost to be delivered, right? And you can start doing that if you know how much a product costs and how many employees are involved in that thing. And so we had a whole team of data analytics uh, that helped us uh, start to think about this stuff. It was not exact number, but it was close enough. It was good enough, you know, to show a way that is quite systematic and quite scientific, if you like, to, to get to what it was looking for. And that really helped us get into the metrics of the things that we wanted to get in, right? Because at, at, up until that point, we had no real uh, kind of financial metrics attached to our map or to our work. But in that case, we really had, and we had permission at that point to actually knock at the door and ask the questions that could help us uh, build a thing, right? So while we were at our mission was nothing to do with automation to prove the, the span of the tech, our mission was to create a map of the land to really show these are all of the things that we deliver in terms of services, in terms of products. These are kind of the, our, what should be our priorities for these reasons, right? We were basically trying to build a decision-making tool. 
But we got there through different alleys. You know, we stopped in the island of tech and saw what the need that was and in what way this thing could help them. And we stopped in the island of operations. And, and so by doing that, we started serving, if you like, different customers and their needs, showing, you know, experimentations, showing iteration, showing, you know, co-creation in the way we were you know, involving a lot of people because this thing really requires the knowledge and skills of a lot of people. Uh, you can't do it otherwise, right? Um, and so start infusing a completely new way to lead the work. Is there a moment where you feel you have to unveil the Trojan horse and say, look, this is what's actually happening. So you start out by just doing the work, getting practical and ju just doing things in a different way. Have you found that there are it is a need for a moment to actually start? No, because the people okay. that you involve, they don't care. I mean, even if you tell them like, okay, whatever, as long as I get my thing, you know, they just really don't care. So, and the people that should know about that are the, your sponsors or the people that bring you in. And they are, of course, are with, in it with you, right? You are one team trying to make this thing work. So, you know, even if you told them, I don't think they would care at all. I mean, it's like, what else? You know, what I need is that number. Did you get the number? You know, whatever you're trying to do. Sure, sure. Okay, okay. The map. Yes, yes. I'm curious if you have found that there's something that helps us to accelerate this transition. Is there is there like a pattern that you've seen? Like, if we do this, things move five times quicker towards the, adopting this new model of leadership. Be prioritize like people tend to go I, I want it all like we have to change now you know all of the things you know and, and and i usually say patience and be strategic so what is your best bet right now your best bet that could really take you to the next step of this journey right and so if you try to burn stages too quickly you create toxicity around you people just don't want to work with you Again, I, I'm. Do you have a story like, and how do you, how do you prioritize? How do you know what is important? Uh, there is, you know, I'm, I'm trying to be very opportunistic because you know there is very little that you can choose when you enter in these organizations. Also, because it's not my organization, I'm not an employee. I'm paid to be there, so I have to prove my value constantly. I'm the first one that they can't when there is a need, right? Um, so I try to be opportunistic. I try to sense, okay, what is that? What is the thing that everyone wants to solve that I can contribute in, in a reasonable time span where I can actually show some value quickly? Um, and so I usually reflect, obviously, on that with the people that are internal in the organization. Um, so, yeah, being opportunistic is definitely the first thing. Um, and then the second thing is really thinking about what are the people that we absolutely want to involve, right? Because I always say, Never have one sponsor for your work because, you know, these people change, they quit, they do other things, they burn out, whatever. So so you need at least two or three people to sponsor your work, to support your work in different forums. And so where do you find these people? So the the, the first thing that I try to understand is, is who has, you know, decision-making power, even if it's, uh, you know, not necessarily formal, but enough influence on decision-makers that can allow us to move forward in the direction that we want to. And so I start looking at these groups of people and then start looking at opportunities that can allow to be us to be close enough to these people, right? Change your leaderships and reorgs are usually great opportunities. And, you know, right now, all of the organizations I'm working with are going through a, a fantastic reorg. And so those, those are good moments because things are shuffling and cards are shuffling and people, you know, have somewhat, you know, the need of clarifying what are the things that you're trying to achieve. So in that chaos, while things settle, that's, that's a good way to run beyond, be, below the radar, right? And see what's the best bet. But it's also like a question of working with design teams in a way that, shows the leadership without being arrogant in practice, which is a very fine line, right? In a sense, you know, you as a design team interact with a ton of people. And so what you want to be doing is for these people to tell around how fantastic it was to work with you, not just because of the output that you created, because half of the people will not even remember that, but the because of the how inspiring the conversation was or how much you listen. Finally, you find somebody to listen to your story and actually understands what you're trying to do, you know? And so having that, you know, collective, if you like, behavior of being a service where being useful, but being inspirational 
is a fine line. A lot of people end up going around and evangelizing, you know, which is the first thing that I said, just stop doing that. Just really stop. Do not talk about design. Do not talk about how great you are, how this artifact is going to change the world because no one is going to listen to you. So it's also a question of aligning. How do we behave in this organization as a group of people? And what are the stories that we tell and what are the things that we share and what we don't share and what we don't tell, right? And that's, uh, so being strategic about your very presence. Nice. Let's try to close the loop. We started with the premise that we want to, we hope that our organizations will move from machines to living beings. Um, is there something that you feel we definitely should have discussed but haven't done so far regards this topic? I guess it's the difference between managers and leaders. That's a whole nother episode, Marzia. I know, sorry. <laughs> Let's not talk about it. Give give uh, give us a, a teaser. I think you know the the role of middle managers is underestimated, and because you know you, you the you know a leader, as I said, is someone that you know creates the conditions for the team and the people around to really perform at the best selves and in the best way and in a way that you know that stays after they're gone. Well, the role of managers is more perceived as someone that has to you know make sure that. The people comply to a specific process of policy, the things move at a certain speed. Uh, so it's a way more tactical, if you like, role. And managers and sometimes are leaders, uh, you know, in the official term, and leaders sometimes are managers, and sometimes they're complete, two completely different uh, roles. I hardly found the leaders that are good managers and the other way around. And so I think this difference is very important in terms of role in this living being structure. And I think it's underestimated uh, how important it is to really spell it out. If you can leave us with something to chew up on, uh, a question, food for thought, what's the question that you'd like us to think about? In what way can you, from your current point of view, lead in a different way? Like you don't need to have a job title that said leaders, the leader to lead. So in what way can you lead today from your standpoint? Thank you. And where can people learn more about you and your work? Mm, I have a Substack. So it's designmavericks.substack.com. There I blog every week on all of these topics. I also have a podcast, like a, on a video series. And I will also there share updates on my book. So that's the best place where to go. I'll make sure that we have the links, obviously, in the show notes. Marcia, uh, it was an absolute honor and pleasure chatting with you again. Uh, let's Likewise. mark our calendars uh, in another in three, three years, years. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yes. for the next update, the next chapter in, in this Perfect. journey that we're on. Thank you for coming on and uh, sharing what you're thinking about these days. Thank you very much, Mark, for inviting me again. I hope you found this conversation with Marcia as thought-provoking as I did. Her insights serve as a reminder that our organizations aren't machines, but rather dynamic, evolving systems. This shift in perspective from rigid predictability to adaptable living beings has profound implications. It calls for a new kind of leadership, one that fosters growth, agility, and a healthy dose of experimentation. So let's continue to challenge the outdated models that are holding us back. If you enjoyed today's conversation, and I hope you did because you're still here, you can do me one big favor. Click the like button on this video if you haven't done so already. Not to feed the YouTube algorithm, but to let me know whether or not we're on the right track by addressing topics like this. Finally, before we part ways, please take a moment to reflect and celebrate that by joining us today, you've directed your attention towards learning and growing as a professional. So from everyone who you're going to impact through your work, thank you for taking the time and making the commitment. My name is Mark Fontijn, and I look forward to having you with us again for a new conversation on the Service Design Show. Take care and see you soon. <laughs>